Okay, uh, first, thanks to the organizer uh, for the invitation. And this is my first visit to ICTS, and I'm really enjoying it. So I'll be talking about uh, dark energy beyond Lambda. So there will be two talk related to that, me and after uh, me, Shubho will talk. And he will mostly concentrate on the observational aspect. I'll talk a little bit theory and a little bit observation mixed. So this is uh, the basic plan. So I just quickly summarize the current state of knowledge that we have now for our universe and the results after the Planck 2015. Uh, where Lambda CDM is quite consistent with the Planck uh, data. Then I'll talk about few inconsistencies that people have pointed out or some recent low redshift observations that pointed out regarding the Lambda CDM. And that actually motivate us to uh, uh, the varying dark energy model. So I'll talk about that. Uh, then I'll talk about the uh, taking into now this the latest low redshift observation together with the Planck and other supernova observations, the constant on this varying dark energy. Uh, then I'll talk about these evidences. You can calculate the Bayesian evidences of all these dark energy models. I'll take a set of around 22 models and try to see that what are the evidences. And uh, lastly, I just talk about the future prospects where we can probe the dark energy at very large scale. Uh, with the experiments like SCA or Euclid, and uh, how we can actually do that. And then I will conclude. So this is the current state of knowledge. So the CMB tells us that the universe is actually spatially flat. So the critical energy density is equal to the total energy density. The distribution of galaxy tells us that the non-relativistic matters, which constitute both the dark matter and the baryonic matter, it is roughly the 30% of the total energy budget. Uh, supernova observations, 1998 onwards, it tells us that the universe is accelerating. Around the present time, it started speeding up. And this needs some kind of repulsive gravitational effects. And these repulsive gravitational effects can either be due to some extra component uh, which, with a negative pressure, which we call dark energy, or due to some modification of Einstein's gravity at large cosmological scale. In this talk, I mostly concentrate on this dark energy structure. So this is this universe composition, So except this 4%, which is mostly in the intergalactic dust and all the stars and galaxies. The rest, 96%, is in the dark component. And around a quarter of that is in the dark matter, uh, which actually creates the attractive gravitational potential so that it, uh, the, uh, the structure can form in the universe. And the rest, 73%, is in the dark energy, which actually uh, uh, determine the destiny of the universe because it is accelerating. So what is happening in the future? So that is determined the dark energy. So both are dark component. They're all, uh, they both don't emit any light. Difference is that it has a large negative pressure for this acceleration. And this dark matter is specialized so that it can actually uh, form structures. So this is just a quick review of the standard cosmology. So in terms of this density parameter of any component, I can be any component, which is basically the ratio between with the critical energy density. One of the Einstein's equations, the Hubble parameter can be written as like this, which has this matter, the radiation part, the curvature part, and there can be any unknown component. Uh, there's an, another second Einstein's equation, which sometimes we call the ratio the equation. So this is given by this. This actually determines this acceleration. And to have this acceleration positive, there's a negative sign. All these components are positive. One need to have this component negative. So this Wx, which is the equation of state parameter for dark energy, the ratio between the pressure and the energy density, this has to be negative. So what kind of form we can have this Wx if it is minus 1? This Fz comp means this Z dependence is just constant or 1. And this is the lambda cosmological constant. This Wx can be a constant. Then this Fz scales like this with the redshift. And if you have any other functional dependence of this Wx, then one has to integrate this stuff so that you can get this dependency on this Fj. So about this curvature, so CMB fast acoustic peak location says mostly the universe special curvature is flat. So we can safely ignore this omega k component. And this radiation component, which is very, very small, this is around 10 to the power minus 5 around present day. So any late time cosmology, we can actually drop these two terms. So only these two are important. So these things to be measured or that to be constant is this, whatever this dark component it has, the matter component it has, and whatever the equation of state and just the, the parameter that you have in this equation of state. So these are these things that one needs to measure. So 
after 2000, I mean, Planck 2015, okay, so measurement of this tiny fluctuation in the CMB cosmic micro background radiation, we know that this concordance lambda CDM model, uh, which is a six parameter model, it is amazingly consistent. So this model with the six parameters where you have this omega m naught, the cosmological constant density parameter, the Hubble uh, parameter at present, the spectral index, these are the spectral index for the primordial fluctuation produced by the inflation, uh, the tau, this optical depth for the deionization, and this amplitude of the primordial fluctuation. So these are the six parameters This determines this, uh, this lambda CDM model. And amazingly, this, this variation of this temperature fluctuation, these are the Planck data, so with these six parameters, only these six parameters, one can actually fit amazingly good this Planck data. So in a sense that this lambda CDM model, and here when you are doing this, when you're getting these numbers, this is not only the Planck data, the supernova data, also the baryon acoustic oscillation data, those are also being included. So this lambda CDM model is quite consistent, there's no doubt about it. And being lambda is the most simplest dark energy candidate, so there's no point of getting any other dark energy. Okay, but one can go beyond lambda. Even if the Planck data, one can go beyond lambda and let's try a non-constant lambda. Uh, so as I said, there are different way one can uh, sort of parameterize the non-constant lambda. There is a universal parameterization, the CPL parameterization. I'll come to this point a little later. So these are by three persons, Chevalier, Polarsky, and Linder. So this parameterization is mostly universal for all to the all the observation. It means whether it's a Planck, whether it's Euclid or whatever. Everybody uses this parameterization. It's a nice parameterization. This parameterization can actually fit to most of the scalar field dark energy model. Okay, so this is a two parameter parameterization. One can see that W0 equal to minus one and WA is zero is just a cosmological constant. So if you take this parameterization and do the same thing that we did for this lambda CDM model, then in the W0, WA plane, this is this confidence contour. This the greens is just with the Planck and the weak lensing. This blue is actually taking the Planck and the other exterior data set, which is the supernova, the, the baryon acoustic oscillation or the HST data. And one can see that here, this W0 equal to minus one and W equal to zero is perfectly consistent. So even if you take a parameterization, which is a non varying lambda, the cosmological constant is quite, uh, quite consistent. One can actually, but one can see that these are actually two parameters, but one can, with these two parameters, one can reconstruct this W as a function of Z. So this is the reconstruction W. The, the red is for Planck with other only BAO or the rear shift space distortion. The blue is with Planck and other data, BAO, supernova, and HST. So this blue, the deep blue and the light blue are basically one sigma and two sigma confidence range. This is the base fit value. And one can see that this W equal to minus one, which is a constant line, this is very much well within this 68%. Okay. So even if you take this non-constant lambda, a parameterization, the cosmological constant is quite consistent. So as I said, this cosmological constant is quite consistent with the CMB, BAO, and supernova, this combination. So what is the point that we need, go, need to go the beyond the lambda? So before that, I just weekly describe that how, given a data, we want to conclude that whether it's a cosmological constant or anything else, right? So given a specific observational data, how we infer the whether the dark energy is a cosmological constant or something else. So take any observable, let's say we take this co-moving distance. So this depends upon, this is the speed of light, this depends upon the H. Then the luminosity distance, which actually the supernova type 1 a measures. So this depend upon this co-moving distance, that means depend upon this H. Angular diameter distance, this sets the angular scale in the sky, whether it's a baryon acoustic oscillation angular scale or CMB acoustic scale angular scale. This also depends upon this, this, this means this angular co-moving distance, so this also depends upon this H. The growth of matter, okay? So this also determined by this equation where this delta time is the density contrast in the matter fluctuation. All the power spectrum for the growth depends upon this delta time. This also depends upon in H, okay? So what we do is actually with all this data, whether it's the supernova data, whether it's the Planck data, whether it's the LLSS data, we actually determine this H, okay? Once I determine this H, then this is the equation of state that one can reconstruct, okay? So I know this H from all this data, 
then I can deconstruct this WJ, okay? And whether this WJ is now consistent with minus one or not, we can say that whether the cosmological constant is consistent or not. But see that here, there's a parameter also, omega M naught is there. So determining this WJ from this H, it is crucial that we know this omega M naught very accurately, okay? Otherwise, you can get a completely wrong determination. Just to give an example, so this is done by these three people, and also later on people confirm this. So let's say I, wait, I take a fiducial model, lambda CTM, okay? W equal to minus one, with the omega naught is 0.27, okay? I take this fiducial model, calculate this, let's say, supernova data, and put random error on that, okay? So take this as my observational data, and take any other dark energy model and try to reproduce, okay? But while reproducing, so now my H is there, sorry. So let's say for supernova, I can calculate this H. Okay, let's say I calculate this H, and with any other dark energy model, with the quintessence model, I try to reconstruct this H, but I wrongly assume omega M0 is 0.22, okay? My actual omega M0 was 0.27, but I wrongly assume this omega M0 is 0.22. I get this reconstructed W, where my actual W is this, okay? If I take omega M0 is 0.32, then this is my reconstructed W which is quite different from the actual W. So as I said, that when I want to do this deconstruction of W, okay, because that is necessary to see that whether it's a cosmological constant or not, it is very important that I know this omega M not very accurately. Otherwise, one can get completely a wrong determination, okay. But there is a better way, and this was actually proposed by these three people, Borun Shani, his students, Shafiqui at that time, is a postdoc, and this Tarot, and Alexis Tarot. What they said that, let's say I take these diagnostics, which is completely determined through this H, okay? Uh, they call it Ohm diagnostics. Now, this doesn't depend upon any omega M0 or other parameters, okay? I can determine it completely directly from the H, if I can construct it. The best part is that, now, if I put for a flat lambda CDM this H expression here, okay, so one can see this A1 and 1 get cancelled, I can take this omega M0 outside, then the numerator and denominator is constant, uh, this cancelled, and omega MZ is just a constant and which gives you the omega M0. So what is that? That if I have this, if I deconstruct this omega ohm diagnostics by this, where I know this H by H0 from data, then if I see now this, whether this ohm parameter is a constant or not, that can give you that whether it's a cosmological constant or not, okay? If ohm constant is not allowed, then one can say this cosmological constant is not allowed. If ohm as a constant is allowed in this reconstruction omega and ohm z, then one can say that the lambda CTM is a consistent. So this is a, and this, as I said, this doesn't take into account of omega m naught or whatever, okay? So we'll use this and we can see that we can get completely different results actually. Okay, so let's now talk about that, as I said, that in Planck data, this is very consistent with the lambda CDM, but after that, there are a few uh, low redshift observations which actually says that there is some tension with this lambda CDM. First is the H0, H0 measurement by this Hubble Space Telescope. This is a recent result by this Riz et al. So they measure this H0, like this, this value, and if we take the Planck 2000 measurement of Hubble parameter for a lambda CDM model, which is this value, and these two are roughly 3.4 sigma difference, okay. So there is a tension of 3.4 sigma. Later on, this, this holy cow measurement of this, we're using this time delay strong lensing probe, which actually measured this time delay due to the strong lensing. It is quite sensitive to the H0. They also measured this H0, which is quite consistent with this, but these two has around 2.5 sigma, 2.6 sigma difference. So if I believe this Planck, the lambda CDM model, as determined by Planck 2015, then for this H0, there is a tension with other H0 measurement coming from the low redshift observations. Uh, let's talk about this gross measurement by the weak lensing. Okay, so this, with this, through this weak lensing, you have these cosmic shears, and these cosmic shears amplitude, they are, they, they are very uh, sensitive to this parameter S8, which is actually related to this. Sigma is the amplitude of the power spectrum or the matter power spectrum. So these kids, this kilo degree survey, they measured this S8, this parameter, this, and this is actually the same thing you can measure for this Planck 2015 lambda CDM model, 
and these two have around 2, 3, 4, 2 point three sigma uh, tension. Okay. And as you can see that in the omega m sigma plane, this is a key measurement. Okay. Uh, this is P Planck W map nine, and there is this is Planck data. Okay. This is a Planck uh, error bar. Okay. So there is some around 2.3, 2.5 sigma uh, tension. Uh, there's also this Lyman alpha forest through their correlation function. You can also there with this baryon acoustic oscillation peak. And there, uh, the, you can also measure H at redshift 2.34, which is around this value. And if you just calculate this H at redshift 2.34, given by Planck 2015 for a lambda CDA model, these two also have a 2.5 sigma tension. Uh, to the redshift space distortion uh, in this matter power spectrum, the Chandra cluster cosmology, the X-ray observation, they measure this, this factor, sigma eight is, as I said, is the, the amplitude of the power matter power spectrum. F is what we call the growth factor. This is determined by this delta time is the matter density contrast. So this is determined by this. So this is also significantly lower than what predicted by the Planck 2015 lambda. And as I said, so they are, I mean, Shubo will discuss many more inconsistency. So they are clear, means in recent times, there are clearly some inconsistency uh, with the Planck 2015 lambda CDM measurement. And also, as we know, that there are some theoretical problems with the lambda CDM model. One is the cosmological constant problem, which is why this cosmological constant is so small. This is not only for the cosmological constant, this is for any dark energy model. And still now there is no solution as it is. And also this cosmic coincidence problem that we have for the cosmological constant, that why the present universe is so special that this dark energy and dark matter are roughly of the same order. This one can solve by this evolved dark energy. So let's go to these dark energy models. So there are hundreds of hundreds of dark energy models. So obviously it is not possible to describe that. I'm, so these are the models I'm a little bit biased with. And uh, I'll also say that why there's some, I mean, reason to take this model. So you can have a constant equation of state. Instead of W equal to minus one, you can take a W constant. So that is one way you can model dark energy. You can take a varying W as a function of jet. There's two ways to do it. One, you just take some scalar field models or some other, uh, say, modified gravity model, where it gives a W as a function of jet. You can also take different, different parameterization, which actually fit a variety of scalar field models or modified gravity model. So here I took around five that different parameterization. Uh, all these parameterizations have two parameters, W0, WA. And at different, different level, they actually give you different, different scalar field behavior. Remember that here, if W is minus one, these are called this non-phantom model. And if W is less than minus one, these are called this phantom model, because here this, there is this, all these instability or ghost problems are there. So these are the parameterization people have used. CPL, as I said, is a universal parameterization. In most of the observational data, people actually code their result in terms of the CPL parameterization. One can go also to these scalar field models. So there are three kinds of scalar field. As I said, that there are many more, but I took these three. They are the most simplest one. One is the normal canonical scalar field that we all know of. You can take also the non-canonical scalar field. There are different, different ways people take this non-canonical scalar field, where this kinetic energy is not canonical. One most popular is some kind of a DBI term. Okay, uh, This was more popular after this tachyon model of Shane's, but that is nothing related to the dark energy, just a kind of a phenomenological action people take with different, different potential. Uh, you can take also a scalar field with a higher derivative term. This comes from some brain wall model, uh, which is this DGP brain wall model. Uh, and then when you write down that effective fourth dimensional uh, Lagrangian, you can get this higher derivative operator. But the good part of it is that, that even if you have this higher derivative operator, your equation of motion are still second order, so you don't have this ghost problem. Uh, in the Minkowski space, this also uh, sort of satisfies the shift symmetry or the Galilean symmetry. So sometimes these models are also called these Galilean models, only with this linear potential. As I said, these are sometimes called these tachyon models, and these are the normal scalar field models. So all these models actually can also be classified or uh, divided into two classes. One called this Thoyer model and it's the freezer or tracker model. What is this Thoyer model? This is something like this inflation model where the scalar field has some flat part of the potential very early time. The Hubble parameter is very high in the early time, so there's a huge friction term. 
the scalar field is initially frozen at the very early time. It behaves like a cosmological constant. And as the Hubble parameter decreases, the scalar field slowly, slowly thaws away from this frozen state. So this equation of state starts increasing from this W equal to minus. It's just like similar to inflation. And here the equation of state is always very close to minus one. It varies from W equal to minus one, but it depends how far it thaws away from its frozen state. Then you have this freezer or tracker model. This is some model which is in 1988, this Peebles and Ratra first described with this inverse square potential. There are no dark energy and all those things is there at that time. But still they showed that there is some certain set of potential like this inverse square potential, where the scalar field initially fast roll, and that time they mimic the background, whatever it's a matter or radiation. And later on, it actually has a flat part where the scalar field just got frozen, and then it gives like a W equal to minus one. So, so this is a pictorial means like what is happening. So here we take for a Thoyer model a linear potential. That means for Thoyer model, you can take any potential. Only thing is that initially you have to uh, sort of uh, make sure that the scale, the, there is a flat part of the potential so that scalar field is frozen. Okay. For th uh, tracker model, there's only a very few uh, set of potential which can give you this tracker behavior. So this is a tracker model that I have taken using a double exponential potential. There's a two exponential potential. The good part of exponential potential is that, that with a single exponential potential, you can always get a constant equation of state. So you can choose a double exponential potential. One actually dominates in the early time, another dominates in the late time. And once dominates, it becomes this constant W equal to zero. Late time, the other dominates and it can give W equal to minus one. Okay. So once is W equal to zero, so this is your matter as it falls, one means one plus jet cube. So this tracker model, so this just tracks this background. And at some point when it comes to this W equal to minus one, it starts dominating and become a cosmological. Whereas this Thoyer model, it initially, as I said, it's thaw, it means it's frozen at W equal to minus one, and it slowly, slowly thaws away from this W equal to minus one. So it, most of the part of its evolution, this behaves like a cosmological constant, and this is the matter it falls. Around the present time, it starts thawing away, so it has some soft sort of a uh, jet dependence or time dependence. Okay. So this is roughly the behavior of the Thoyer and tracker or freezer. So what we actually, by observation, do try to sort of constrain this region, okay, where this tracker approach W equal to minus one with this slope, where the Thoyer actually goes away from the W equal to minus one with this. So whether this observationally, we can actually probe these two. No, 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 means inflate or no. These are not inflate on field. But for this tracker, for this Thoyer model, one can actually show that you can set the initial condition through the inflation, actually. But these are not inflate on field. Okay. So there's a work by Linda and Caldwell. They showed that all these Thoyer and tracker model, if you take their W and how the W varies with respect to the scale factor, there is a region in the parameter space where all the Thoyer model are in this region, it means bounded by 1 plus W and 3 into 1 plus W, and all the freezing model are in this region. Okay, So it is a nice plot because now with the data, if you can constrain this region, one can see that whether this Thoyer or these freezing models are allowed or not. Okay, We'll see that we'll do this very, very quickly. Okay, so now all this parameterization that I just, just now described, so here, uh, the CPL is mostly a Thoyer parameterization. The seven CPL, where you see the CPL, but there is a power of seven. So this is a freezer model, okay? This GCG model, it can behave both as Thoyer or tracker, depending upon this WA parameter. But these two other two things, parameterization, they're both are Thoyer models, okay? So defined different models are between different behavior, whether this behave like a Thoyer or behave like a freezer. And we'll see that which one is more allowed by the observational data. Okay. okay, so now let's see that what we know till now. It means after Planck, then we have this data from the H measurement, we have the data from the growth measurement. So if you add those data together, the previous data like Planck, supernova, baryon acoustic oscillation, where now we stand. Okay. So this is still the Planck did. So now we add all these growth measurement to this redshift distortion the H measurement, the H naught measurement. So all this data we add. 
we take the CPL parameterization because, as I said, the CPL parameterization is a universal parameterization. So all the observational results, they quote with the CPL parameterization. So that's why we also use this parameterization. So these red contours, they are with only, uh, okay, so the green contours with only CPA, uh, this CMB, bio one supernova, when you only add this growth, and the red ones is with the growth, we also add this Hubble data, okay. Now one can see that in the green contour, W equal to minus one is quite consistent. But we, as we add this age data, the W equal to minus one is just at the age or just going out from this two sigma contour. This is this freezer model that we just described, this bound. These are the Thoyan model that we described this bound. As you see it that for this, when you add all the data, the freezer model is roughly ruled out, okay? The Thoyer model, there's a, there's a very, very tiny place over here, which is just allowed. Otherwise, also the Thoyer models are also ruled out. Now, this is interesting in a sense. First, that here it says that W equal to minus one is just around two sigma or just outside the two sigma. But on the other hand, it says that this kind of freezer or Thoyer model, these are quite inconsistent, okay? Now, if we take any scalar field model, like a canonical scalar field, uh, then it has to be only non-phantom model. A canonical scalar field cannot be a phantom model. But all these canonical scalar field or the scalar field model, they are either Fisher and Thoyer. So it seems that they are roughly kind of ruled out or kind of inconsistent around at least two sigma. In a sense, it also says that now if we have this dark energy, this result says that we need to go beyond the canonical scalar field where we need, where we can actually model also the non-phantom, uh, the phantom model. Right? So that is this thing. So, so this is now this W parameterization that I earlier showed for the Planck. So this is the W behavior. This is in the blue region, this is the one sigma and the green region is the two sigma. This is the base fit value, means base fit behavior. And as you said that W equal to minus one, this is out for the two sigma means region around this red shift, okay. So you cannot have a W equal to minus lambda CDM model, which is consistent at the two sigma for all the red shift, okay. Which is now also still, as I said, consistent with the loaded shift inconsistency that I, I mentioned earlier. If you go to this sigma at omega and m naught plane, okay, as I showed earlier, this plank was just outside this boundary, but now in with our, this, so this is the kit survey data and this is the our measurement now. So this is quite consistent with the kit survey data. Okay. The sigma, the S8 value that, as I said, the plank result and the kit survey, they have around 2.5, 2.6 sigma inconsistency. But this is also quite consistent with the kit survey. So as we go beyond the lambda CTM, taking all this data, okay, uh, it seems that there is an inconsistency with the lambda CDM. But if you take the varying dark energy, things are quite consistent. So can you actually say that? Huh? Means redshift. Okay, so if we go as very early to the higher rate shift, then the dark energy effect is not there actually. Dark energy just goes to zero. So there you don't get any bound on dark energy. Okay, so left curve is basically you have this W zero WA. From here you just reconstruct the W. Okay. But okay, so as I said that now we have this, so can we now say that okay, with all this data, whether this lambda CTM is inconsistent or not? So I initially mentioned there's another diagnostics, the ohm diagnostics is a diagnostics which doesn't depend on omega m naught. And if this ohm parameter is a constant, then it actually cons means says that it's a lambda CDM model. So we reconstruct the ohm now, okay? So this is the ohm reconstruction, the same data, the same model, okay? We reconstruct this ohm diagnostic. But you can see that here, you can surely have a constant ohm, which is consistent with this reconstruction. There's no, no point, means you can always draw a constant line over here, okay? And ohm constant is just lambda CDM. So even if you look at this W parameterization and you say that this lambda CDM is in, uh, means not consistent, you can take a defined diagnostics and you can see that, okay, no, lambda CDM is quite right, quite consistent. So I think most of the time, all these results quotes with W reconstruction, but there can be other way that one can also say kind of a different results. And to confirm, as I said, CPL is mostly like a Thoyer model. We just did it for another parameterization, which is a freezer or tracker parameterization, the seven CPL. And we get the same, I mean, this ohm reconstruction. Here also, the ohm 
constant is allowed. Okay. So completely two different behavior of dark energy, you reconstruct comb, still the lambda C time is quite allowed here. Fine. So, so it depends upon which kind of way you want to probe the dark energy. Fine. This says that there's no problem with that. Okay. So the constant OMJ is consistent and the lambda CDM is consistent. Only thing is that here, if you now see that what is the constant ohm number, because the ohm, as I said, gives you the omega m naught. So that omega m naught is slightly less than what the Planck determined for the lambda CDM model. That's it. Otherwise, ohm means lambda CDM is quite consistent. So now we try to see that, okay, we have this data. We take around 20, 22 models, try to calculate the Bayesian evidence of all these models including the lambda CDM, and compare this with the lambda CDM model, okay? Adding these defined, defined data. So this is the evidence, actually, sometimes you call this global likelihood. So this is the likelihood function, and this is the prior, and this integral you have to do in the d-dimensional place, d is the number of parameters that you have, okay? So this integration is a little bit different, but one can do it with this nested sampling called the multi-nest, and one can do this integration. Uh, now, if you want to compare these two models, there is a Jeffrey scale which says that now you calculate Z, take this logarithm of this Z, and compare the defiance of log Z between two models. If this defiance is within one, so there is no evidence. Within one and one, 2.5, there is a significant evidence for this model which has a higher Z. 2.5 to 5, there is a strong evidence. Greater than 5, there is a DC scale. So we can actually calculate the odd ratio and see that. So here there is nothing. Here the odd ratio is roughly 2. Uh, rough, this is roughly two odd ratio, this is roughly seven odd ratio, this is roughly around 20 to 150, this is more than 150 odd ratio. Okay, so now this we have done. Uh, so this is just taking supernova, CMB, and Bayer model. These are all these different, different dark energy model, around 20 of it. This line is the lambda CDM, this horizontal line. Anything that is below this line, has their odd ratio with all this evidence which is less than lambda CDM, means this value is this defiance of log jet. Anything above that has a evidence which is greater than lambda CDM. Okay. So uh, here we just take the same thing, the supernova, the CMB, and BAO. Uh, this is the CPL parametrization. Okay. This is uh, constant, this is the CPL parametrization. Mostly there is, there is some models that are some significant, but not that much of defines ev means evidence than the lambda CDM. One parametrization, which is GCG, one which is the GCG as a tracker model. As I said, the GCG can be a both tracker and thoyer. So where the GCG be like a tracker model, it has a very significant amount of strong evidence in means against, means it is bad than the lambda CDM, okay. Otherwise, mostly the same. Number of parameters and defines. So there's integration, yeah. Not, not many. Mostly have the two parameters, and they are some models have three parameters. Okay. So now you have the growth. Okay. Still, there is not that much of say, change. Only CPL is now have a very large evidence against means the lambda CDM is much much better than the CPL. Okay. When you add the growth, uh, and this is when you add all the data, the supernova CMB bio. Oh, there should be growth also. Okay. It also has the growth. The growth and the Hubble, okay? So this is the thing, okay? So now you can see that this model, this, this parametrization has the evidence 2.91 greater than the lambda CDM. So it has a very strong evidence uh, better than the lambda CDM. These are kind of a significant evidence in comparison to the lambda CDM. The rest are actually insignificant, fine? So what, as you can see, and this model is quite bad than the lambda CDM. So as you see that defined, defined parametrization also, whether you take, when you compare with the lambda CDM, if you take defined, defined parametrization, you can get defined, defined results, fine? So, I mean, just saying that this lambda CDM is good or lambda CDM is bad, bad means there is no point of it because it depends upon what kind of parametrization you, you, you take, okay? As I said, mostly people take this CPL parametrization. And this parametrization with lambda CDM, it is almost the same. Okay, when you take all these data. Okay, so uh, so what we can do in the in future? So one is that we can probe this dark energy at the very large scale. As I said, most of this data that we have used, they use they actually probe dark energy 
only at the background expansion. When the, what is its effect in the background expansion? Because as I said, most of them, this uh, observable depend on H, dark energy effect on H. So it just how the dark energy affects the background expansion. As you go to the large scale, then the dark energy also, this fluctuation in dark energy is also important. So there, it can have a very distinguishable effect than lambda CDM because lambda being a constant doesn't fluctuate. Okay. If you take any other dark energy model, it fluctuates. So at large scale, it has some effect. So if you can probe uh, this dark energy or this large scale or galaxy over density at very large scale, then there is a possibility that you can probe different dark energy model compared to the lambda C. And there is a prospect back because all this future observational setup, whether it's SK or Euclid, they'll probe a very, very large volume. And that actually makes them to calculate or to measure the power spectrum. So this is the error in power spectrum, okay, with respect to jet, all beyond the horizon scale, okay. So if you go beyond horizon scale, be very, very large scale, then you can, can measure like SK, okay, it can measure the galaxy power spectrum uh, less than 10% percent percentage level, okay. And this is roughly around five, three, five, uh, four, five percent. Okay. So what we can have now, so I'm not going to the full calculation, but this we are doing now. So let's take, you take canonical scalar field model with defined, defined potential, and you calculate the power spectrum, in, taking into account the dark energy perturbation and defined, defined relativistic uh, correction that is applicable at the very large scale. And you calculate these for defined, defined dark energy, also for the lambda CDM, and you calculate the percentage deviation of each model from the lambda CDM. So this percentage deviation is for each model from the lambda CDM, okay? As you see that for small scale, the difference is very small. There is absolutely no difference. But as you come to the very, very large scale with redshift one, you can get defiance up to 3% three, three or something like that, okay? Other models can give you a little bit more. We are just uh, considering that, those calculations now. But as, as from one can see that with this, the previous graph, okay? And with this kind of result, it may happen that if you can prove to this SK very, very large scale uh, and calculate the power spectrum, measure the power spectrum, it may be that one can actually probe the dark energy with con uh, respect to the cosmological constant beta. Okay. This is the same we have done for a Thoyer and tracker field. So the tracker model doesn't have that much difference from the cosmological constant, but Thoyer model can have a big better difference from the cosmological constant. So this may be interesting in future, bringing into account the SK and other data. So I just conclude. So there are some tension with the Planck 2015 results uh, for lambda CDM and the low redshift observation, as I said, uh, whether it's H naught measurement or uh, the Keats quick lensing shear measurement or the Lyman alpha BO measurement. Uh, this may be solved through a varying dark energy that we show through a CPL parameterization. But one needs to be careful because defined diagnostics can give defined predictions. As I said, that even if you take a blue parameterization, which gives you a uh, inconsistent, which is inconsistent with all these data, but when you take this ohm diagnostics, it is quite consistent. The lambda CDM is quite consistent. Also, the prediction are highly dependent upon the dark energy parameterization use. Some parameterization has much better evidence than lambda CDM some of the same evidence of lambda CDM. So uh, you cannot conclude it very confidently. Uh, future observations like SK, uh, it can probe dark energy fluctuations at very large scales. And this can be a smoking gun because cosmological constant being a constant, it doesn't fluctuate. So any other dark energy model fluctuates. So if you can probe this cosmic power spectrum at very large scale, it can give you a direct handle to detect the variation from the cosmological constant. So this may be more effective to distinguish from that. So I, oh, thank you. So as we know, this, this scalar fields cannot live in isolation. I mean, they somehow needs to be screened from this fifth force. And they, if, you, if you add any of the fifth force mechanism to avoid, uh, then how does this result change? I mean, either oh, okay. for the structure so, formation. Okay. So in most of these cases, you, you assume this scalar field, this doesn't interact with any other. I mean, when you do this thing, any other uh, uh, baryons or dark matter, fine. 
now obviously as you said that you cannot keep them separated from so there can be interaction uh, so most of the time so there can be this chameleon kind of effect where people try to just uh, keep them shield off from this thing there are couple or interacting quintessence model people have uh, considered means they are actually now considering in a lot where they assume that somehow they are not interacting with the baryon but they can interact with the dark matter thing and then that effect, there can be large effect of that in the power spectrum when this dark energy or this scalar field model, they interact with the dark. There is a model, there is a construction by uh, Shandeep, Shudagar and some of other guy where they constructed a dark energy model, okay, where supposedly in some string theory setup, but supposedly they, in that model, they could isolate the scalar field from interacting with the baryon or the standard model set. They, they showed that, I, mean, I am not an expert, but they showed that the scalar field in that model cannot come, uh, interact with the baryon, but it can interact with the other dark matter. Uh, so that is one construction. I don't know any other construction where this has, people have showed that, but at the phenomenological level, people work with the case that the scalar field doesn't interact with the baryon so that you can keep up this fifth post kind of problem. They can interact with the dark matter and what is the observation of signature? The rest of this FR gravity model, they, where they interact, is you cannot avoid this interaction. You can do this chameleon kind of mechanism to uh, separate them. But I, I agree with you, there's a large, strong solar system or local gravity constraint that, that is always playing. Yeah, to go back to my earlier question, so if you have uh, dark energy that turns on at later than redshifts of uh, three. So mostly these are I mean, dark energy mostly they are important after redshift to something like that. Before that, if you set it to zero, then none of the observations. No, no, it's not set it to zero. So if you just take that, say all these things you dynamically evolve, let's say from the decoupling era, redshift thousand, fine. Okay. But there, you, you you show that okay, if I have to have dark energy around today around seventy percent, right. okay, the evolution is such that that around redshift that thousand or something. This dark energy component is very, very small. Because if you have a very large dark energy, because that is some constant that you put by hand. Because if this dark energy is very, very uh, huge at early time, means it just changes that structure form and structure never form because it has a huge repulsive effect. I, I guess my question is if you set it to zero at some speed, what zero is that? 